أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يبقه قولي ربي زدني علما اللهم فقهنا في الدين إلهي أمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I welcome all of you to our Ramadan Quran Connect uh, program session number 27 and I apologize for starting late because I was going through some uh, technical difficulties technical issues so alhamdulillah um, now it's fixed so inshallah let us begin so a few highlights of just number 22. Um, this is going to have continuation of Surah Ahzab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will mention to us the household of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his pious wives. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards for the believing men and women. Um, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's marriage is going to be mentioned with Zainab radiallahu anha and the finality of the prophethood uh, of the of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is going to be highlighted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to mention to us a beautiful beautiful ayah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will highlight that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is sent to us as a witness as a siraj of Munira, as a bearer of glad tidings and a shining lamp. Also, we learn from the surah that the marriages of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they took place due to certain hikmah behind them, certain wisdom behind them, and subhanAllah, they carry some privileges and restrictions. We also learn in just number 22, Rules of conduct in domestic relations, rules of hijab are going to be highlighted further. We will also have Surah Saba in this Surah. In this Surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, uh, is going to highlight to us the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Prophet Dawud alayhi salam and Sulaiman alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's judgment on the people of Saba. Ingratitude leads to loss in this world and the hereafter. Then in this juz, we're also going to have Surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to highlight to us in the surah his ultimate creative power and his angels. None can stop the mercy of Allah. And what we need to do is that we need to be aware of shaitan. The success of the truth over falsehood and success is definitely uh, going to prevail over the falsehood. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the power to remove us and bring another group in our place. So that's why we need to seize this opportunity and follow the Quran and follow the footsteps of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in order to um, lead uh, a right, inshallah, in order to attain success in dunya and akhirah. And subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights to us that every people, every nation was um, given a prophet, was given a book. So that's why we need to hold on to this kalam and we need to follow this kalam. In the same juz, we'll also have Surah Yasin. In this juz, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to highlight to us the true qualities of believers. How are they? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives time to us in order to repent. So that's going to be highlighted. Um, the importance of, um, you know, having time, having opportunity um, and seizing that opportunity. So that's going to be highlighted. The truth of the Quran and the truth of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to mention to us how Allah's messengers came to different people, different, nation, um, and the, uh, different nations and the response of those to whom the prophets were sent and the results of their denial. So um, that was uh, some of the highlights of this juz, juz number 22. And for our recap, the ayah that I have highlighted for all of us to ponder and reflect is the ayah uh, of Surah Ahzab. And this is Surah Ahzab, ayah number 21, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسْتَنَا There has certainly been for you in the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam an excellent pattern for anyone who's who hope um who has hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the last day and who remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala often so when we talk about following the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of course that presents to us our entire life the way how we should sleep the way how we should wake up the way how we should react in troubled times in times of calamity in times of affliction all our life should actually center around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we should take him as a role model and follow his legacy. So again, SubhanAllah, different parts of his life highlight to us different lessons. 
right? But subhanAllah, today we're going to zoom in to one particular aspect, which is subhanAllah, how did he live Ramadan? And even in Ramadan, how did he excel in the last 10 nights of Ramadan? So we need to ask ourselves, do we wish to be maximizers or do we want to be minimizers? And subhanAllah, this whole journey that we have from birth till our last moment on earth, till we die, the two essentials that we need for our journey to stay on board with taqwa, with God consciousness, there are two tools. And what are they, number one? We have to journey with the Quran. There is no if, buts, and whys. We have to journey with the Quran because that's the manual of Hidayah, which is for us, which is given to us in order to excel. And of course, when we, um, you know, we're, we're going on, we're setting off on a journey, we need GPS, right? We need directions. And subhanAllah, what is the GPS in order to journey through this Quran? Our GPS is the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that's something we have to keep in mind that no matter whatever we do, he is our role model that we need to follow, subhanAllah. So when we talk about following the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and following the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam right now in Ramadan during the last 10 nights, of course, it raises a lot of questions as to how can we emulate him? right because at times we think to ourselves that he was the prophet of Allah that's why he was able to do it but we're not as strong as him how can we do it and that's why subhanallah we have the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam recorded for us so that each time we slack off each time we forget each time we feel guilty that that Ya Rab, when Ramadan started, I made such a good schedule. I made so many du'as. I intend to do so many things. But subhanAllah, the situation didn't favor me or I either became lazy and what should I do? Ramadan is almost over. I didn't feel like I even achieved anything. So what should I do? So let us remind ourselves that now is the grand finale. Now is the moment when the marathon is almost over. And here we are, subhanAllah, witnessing the last 10 nights of Ramadan 2021, inshaAllah, in order to compensate for our loss, whatever we were not able to do in the initial 20 days, let us make, let us try our best to make it to this last final round. Because if we can achieve this home run, then indeed we have won. So let's go for it. The Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever stays awake in anticipation of Laylatul Qadr and succeeds in getting it, will have all of his sins forgiven, past and future. SubhanAllah. So definitely it's, it's worth it. It's worth it to try to put in our best of efforts and inshallah be hopeful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to reward us. So when we talk about Laylatul Qadr, of course, um, we have to keep in mind that when we journey through these last 10 nights of Ramadan, we have three types of seating arrangement. Number one is first class, number two is business class, and number three is economy class. So before I plan on journeying this, um, you know, going on board this venture, I need to choose which seating arrangement I would prefer. So what is the first class seating arrangement? The first class seating arrangement means that I am going to stay awake and seek Laylatul Qadr, inshallah, for all 10 nights. For all 10 nights, inshallah. That is the first class. Number two, the business class entails that we're going to seek Laylatul Qadr in the odd nights. So 21st, 23rd, 25th, 27th, 29th. 
And then economy class entails that we only aim to seek Laylatul Qadr during the 27th of Ramadan. And subhanAllah, we don't want to fly economy class, right? We don't want to even fly business class. Inshallah, this Ramadan, we want to aim high. We want to raise the bar higher, lift the bar higher. And we want to join the first class. We want to be on board um, for the first class, inshallah. So let us plan for it. Inshallah, if I want to do it. So simple sunnahs of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam practice his 10 last nights of Ramadan? And how did the Sahaba, the companions followed him? One beautiful sunnah is that the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would take a bath and perfume themselves during the last 10 nights of Ramadan. And it, in addition to that, they would pray Fajr. So after staying awake for all night, they would pray Fajr and they would prolong Salat al-Fajr until it was almost time for sunrise. So subhanAllah. It's definitely first class because of course it's not easy. But inshallah, if we want to have the first class of Jannah, then that's what we're aiming for, inshallah. So let us not slack off. Now is the time, subhanAllah, to tighten our waist belt and inshallah get to going. So this very um, you know, small sunnah that we can start off with is to take a bath, to take a whistle, perfume ourselves, wear nice clothes, and inshallah get started with it. Okay, why so? Because we know from Surah Qadr that this particular night grants us a reward as if we worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for 80 plus years. Because this particular night is worth more than 1,000 months, subhanAllah. Which tells us what? Which tells us that if you were to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for one second of this night, one second of your ibadah is going to count for almost 23 hours of worship. And subhanAllah, that's a lot, right? I don't even think we can do it in a day, 23 hours staying awake and just being in a continuous state of ibadah. It's hard, but subhanAllah, this is the privilege that we can have inshallah if we aim for first class inshallah. So what's the plan? In order to have the ultimate first class experience, we need to just remind ourselves every time we feel tired, we feel exhausted, I wanna fly first class, okay? I wanna fly first class. So what should we do? What is the basics of this class that I can start with? Number one, long qiyam. And not just long qiyam, long qiyam with prolonged bowing and prostrations. Because that was the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He would pray long qiyam, so he would recite long surahs in his qiyam. And then he would even prolong his ruku and sujood. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would actually make a lot of du'as during his prostration. And he would make a lot of supplications. So this is something that we can aim for in order to have the ultimate first class experience by prolonging our salah, reciting the Quran as much as we can, plus adding the surplus of du'as, of supplications in our prostrations, inshallah. What's number two? In order to have the ultimate first class experience, we need to zoom into our du'a mode, which means that we need to actually make a list of all the things that we want for myself, for my husband, for my parents, for my children, for my family, for my community, for my relatives, for everyone, for all the people for the entire ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when we think about zooming into the amul, we have to keep in mind that I'm not surrounded by any distractions. I am in a quiet place. I am having this interaction one-on-one -on -one with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala so that I can truly feel this experience. 
So we're just, you know, sitting in the corner of the room and just making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just crying in front of him, begging to him, pleading to him, just like a faqir, just like a bankrupt who's begging to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we were not able to do what we planned, because we slacked off during the entire Ramadan. <laughs> So what's the best dua that the Prophet taught us during these last 10 nights? The Prophet taught us to recite, Allahumma inna ka afuwan tuhibwa affa fa'afwani. This is one thing that we all have to aim, subhanAllah, to recite this dua, because this was the dua that the Prophet wasallam taught Aisha radiallahu anha, that if you were to seek Laylatul Qadr, recite this, which means, Ya Allah, indeed, you are forgiving and you love to forgive, so forgive me. Allahumma ameen. That's what we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What else can we do in order to have the ultimate first class experience to give sadaqa every night? Now, when we think about it, how can I give sadaqa every single night? Because many of us, we have already given sadaqa. Many of us, we have already donated um, you know, money to masjid or to you know, any other organization. So what should we do? SubhanAllah, there is a website called my10nights.com. And subhanAllah, this basically automates our donations during the last 10 nights of Ramadan so that we never miss giving on any of these 10 nights. So whatever we give, whether it's 20, 50, $100, whatever we give, subhanAllah, it's going to automate our donations to go to each and different organizations during the last 10 nights of Ramadan. SubhanAllah. So that's something that we can aim for, to give sadaqa every single night during these last 10 nights. What else can we do? Of course, reciting the Quran as much as we can. Because what is the highlight Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us in Surah Baqarah about Ramadan? Ramadan was highlighted as the month of the Quran. Right? So we need to shine our Ramadan through Quran, by Quran, via Quran. So listening to the recitation of Quran as much as we can, listening to the tafsir of Quran as much as we can, reciting the Quran as much as we can. So now when we think about it, subhanAllah, many of us, what, you know, what's our concern? Um, we are concerned that some of us are having periods and how, um, you know, I am going to seek Laylatul Qadr because I'm on my periods. So what can we do again? SubhanAllah, a quick reminder for myself and all of us. During periods, it's, it's okay that we're not able to pray long qiyam, right? We're not able to, SubhanAllah, touch the mushaf. But there are so many things that we can still do. We can remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through zikr. We can maximize on our dua by saying the dua that was taught to Aisha radiallahu anha. By reading all the duas that we made as a checklist. By reciting all the duas that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa taught us through his masnoon duas. Through masnoon askar, right? So there's so many things that we can do. We can listen to the Quran. We can listen to the tafsir of Quran. We can do a lot. We can still maximize. So what is the plan ultimately in order to have the ultimate first class experience? We have to push ourselves a little extra. So if we were initially reciting one page a day before, let us maximize and recite two pages per night three pages per night, five pages per night. If we were standing in Qiyam for one hour before, let us double it. Let us stand in Qiyam for two hours now, three hours now, how much our health allows, how much we can. If we were spending one hour in the us, again, double it. Let's increase it and spend two hours supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And let us not forget, the time of night duration for us, for the believers, it starts from Maghrib 
and ends at Fajr. So even that, let's prioritize it. Let's not waste our time eating and sitting at the dinner table for hours doing nothing. Rather, let us use it effectively and start planning it now. So let's try to eat less, avoid oily foods so that we're not lethargic when we are actually standing up to pray, to do qiyam. And then last but not the least, subhanAllah, let us share our action plan with our friends, with our family, so that together as a team, we can achieve this. And inshallah, if we make the offer, if we give our best, and we're hopeful in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can do it, inshallah. So let's go for it. We have a Laylatul Qadr to accomplish, inshallah. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Ya Rabb grant us the ultimate first class experience. Ya Allah, we ask you to grant all of us to have the privilege of attaining Laylatul Qadr. This Ramadan and inshallah, every Ramadan to come. Because this was the connection of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with Ramadan. His passion was the Quran. His addiction was salah. And his contentment was this be zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant all of us this kind of obsession. Insha'Allah. Allahumma ameen. So let us begin our session for today. Inna alhamdulillah. Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati a'amalina man yahdiillahu falamudillalah wa man yudlil falahadiyalah wa ashadu wa la ilaha illallah wa ahtahu la sharika lahu wa anna muhammadan abuduhu wa rasuluh sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so we're going to begin from ayah number 12 of Surah Ahzab. So when we talk about Surah Ahzab, this surah, as we see the name, is named after the Battle of Ahzab. And the other name for this battle is also Khandaq, Trench, the Battle of Trench. And what happened, just a little background of this um, battle, um, this was the battle when various tribes got together with the Quraysh of Mecca, with the idol worshippers of Mecca, and together they formed an army of 10,000 people in order to attack the Muslims. And subhanAllah, the Muslims had never fought against such a huge number. So, of course, they were in panic mode, yet they trusted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they tied their camel, and they planned for it. So suggestions were taken from the Sahaba, from the companions as to what should we do. And on the suggestion of Salman al-Farsi, one of the companions, they dug a trench around the city of Medina in order to protect themselves. So this was a very new strategy, a very foreign strategy to the people of Mecca. And definitely, subhanAllah, when they saw this, they were baffled. They were dumbfounded. So what happened was that, subhanAllah, each person was required to guard the trench 24-7, while others were told to safeguard the women and the children. And of course, this demanded a lot of sacrifice of sleep rest, deprivation of food and hunger. So what happened was the hypocrites, the munafiqeen of Medina, they came up with all excuses in order to be exempted. They came to mock at the Muslims. They started belittling the efforts of the Muslims. And subhanAllah, these ayat were revealed in that context. So yet, subhanAllah, when we talk about Laylatul Qadr, sometimes it seems like challenging for us, right? Maybe because we are old and subhanAllah, our knees doesn't allow us to prolong our qiyam due to arthritis or other reason. Maybe because we're a student and subhanAllah, we have school pressure, work assignments, and we're not able to recite as much Quran as we planned for. Maybe because we're working, we're not able to do a lot of this bih, or maybe because we're on our periods. So we are restrained from some of the modes of ibadah. So what should we do? This, this battle, 
it actually gives us hope that many a times if we feel that things are not going as we plan or situation is not going according to my desire, whether it's due to a financial crisis or marital crisis or any other reason, let us remember that as long as we put in our effort, as long as we give our best shot, and we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we are hopeful in him, subhanAllah, no matter how many people are there, just like the people, the Sahaba had to face 10,000 army. So just like that, no matter how many reasons are there for us to not have that ultimate experience, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of his mercy, out of his rahmah, he's going to grant us the first class of Laylatul Qadr. He will grant us, inshallah, the first class of Jannah, which is Al Firdaus. So let us aim for it and let us make dua for it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant all of us the opportunity that this Quran can actually become a lifeline for us throughout our life, inside Ramadan and outside Ramadan. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to follow the footsteps of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by using his sunnah as our GPS. So let us start. Ayah number 13, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, and when a party of them said, O people of Yathrib, there is no stand possible for you. Therefore, go back. And a band of them asked her permission of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, truly, our homes lie open to the enemy and they lay not open, they but wished to flee. So who are these people? These people are the munafiqeen. These people are the hypocrites who are not willing to participate in this battle. And what are they doing? They're actually um, targeting other Muslims also to feel um, you know, to feel low about themselves and to feel uh, remorseful about the situation and flee. So what happened next? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in ayah number 14, Surah Ahzab, and if the enemy had entered from all sides of the city and they had been exhorted to al-fitna, they would surely have committed it and would have hesitated thereupon but little. And indeed, they had already made a covenant with Allah not to turn their backs and a covenant with Allah must be answered for. So what is this covenant Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning about? It's actually the covenant which was made uh, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to Medina. He actually sanctioned a constitution in which all the citizens of Medina took a pledge to protect each other as a unified nation. So in this pledge, in this constitution, the Muslims of uh, Medina were, were involved. The hypocrites were involved, as well as the Yahud, the Jews of Medina were involved. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring over here to that pact, that covenant, that even though all these people, they signed that covenant, yet there were some of them, the Yahud especially, who broke off. I number 15, say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to these hypocrites who ask your permission to run away from you. Flight will not avail you if you flee from death or killing, and then you will enjoy no more than a little while. So these munafiqeen, what did they do? They wanted to flee from the battlefield because they were too scared they're going to die. And subhanAllah, if a person loves dunya, his ultimate goal is to seek the pleasures of dunya, then he doesn't want to die, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing their, their fear over here that if a person is destined to die at a certain time, he will die. Death will overtake him. So why should he fear death? Rather, what's the better option? To prepare for death. To prepare for death through righteous deeds. I number 17, say who is he who can protect you from Allah if he intends to harm you or intends to send mercy on you? And they will not find besides Allah for themselves any valley, any protector or any helper. Allah already knows those among you who keep back men from fighting in the cause of Allah and those who say to their brethren, come here towards us. 
while they themselves come not to the battle except a little. Being miserly towards you as regards help, then when fear comes, you will see them looking to you, their eyes revolving as if one over whom howers death. But when the fear departs, they will smite you with their sharp tongues, miserly towards spending anything in good. Such have not believed. Therefore, Allah makes deeds fruitless, and that is ever easy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again, further characteristics of the hypocrites are exposed over here. Then it, when it comes to speaking, they will cross all bounds to hurt the believers, to harm the believers. And that's what they did, whether it was the Battle of Ahzab or other times. So again, we need to see as believers, we shouldn't harm others. We shouldn't harass others with our tongues. Because that is a characteristic trait of the hypocrite. I number 20, they think that Ahzab have not yet withdrawn. And if the Confederates should come again, they would wish they were in the deserts, wandering among the Bedouins, seeking news about you from a far place. And if they happen to be among you, they would not fight but little. So what would they do, these hypocrites? They would just keep on asking questions and they would not put in any effort. The Muslims, they were undergoing tested times and there was a dire need for help. Each citizen had to be involved to protect their city, to safeguard their city. However, the hypocrites, they failed to abide by that promise. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us in ayah number 21 that we just discussed. Indeed, in the messenger of Allah, you have a good example to follow for him who hopes for the meeting with Allah and the last day and remembers Allah much. So we have to follow the Prophet وسلم, because in it is our key to success. And the Prophet وسلم, portrayed the best example in terms of patience when he was under pressure, when he was facing a calamity and in times of ease. He was patient and humble. So definitely, if we read the seerah of the Prophet wasallam, there are multiple pearls and jewels for us to learn and adorn ourselves, inshallah. I number 22. And when the believers saw the confederates, they say, this is what Allah and his messenger wasallam, have promised us. And Allah and his messenger wasallam, had spoken the truth. And it only added to their faith and to their submissiveness to Allah. So even though the believers saw the confederates and who were the confederates, the 10,000 people, the army who came to fight the Muslims. Still, even though they were feeling traumatized, even though they were apprehensive for their families, for their children, yet they knew that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised them victory, if the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa has comforted them, then indeed the promise of Allah shall come true. So what happened, subhanAllah, they went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and they asked, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is there anything that we can say? Because the time has come when our hearts have reached our throats. Meaning, that's how much we are scared. That's how much we are uh, traumatized. So Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa give us some words that we can supplicate with. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught them a beautiful du'a which is Allahumma stur awratina wa amir rawatina. Ya Allah, cover our weak points and calm our fears. SubhanAllah, a beautiful du'a that even we can recite in order to overcome our fears. I number 23, among the believers are men who have been true to their covenant with Allah. Of them, some have fulfilled their obligations, meaning that they have marked, you know, they have received a martyrdom. And some of them are still waiting, means they haven't received martyrdom, but they have never changed, meaning they never became treacherous. They never deceived or cheated. 
in the least. That Allah may reward the men of truth for their truth and punish the hypocrites if he wills or accept their repentance by turning to them in mercy. Verily, Allah is ever oft forgiving and most merciful. And Allah drove back those who disbelieved in their rage. They gained no advantage. Allah sufficed, uh, Allah sufficed for the believers in the fighting by sending against the disbelievers a severe wind. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ever all strong and all mighty. So subhanAllah, uh, because the believers, um, they relied upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they trusted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What happened was that after one month or so, subhanAllah, the disbelievers, they kept camping outside because they were not able to cross the trench. They were not able to come inside and attack Medina because Medina was surrounded by this trench. They kept camping outside for a month or so, and subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala struck them with a fierce wind, with a severe wind, which actually um, you know, extinguished their lamps, which actually ruined their food and killed their cattle. And they were forced to leave. So the help, the nusra, the victory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did come. But did it come immediately? No. Did it come, um, you know, without uh, the missing element trust? No. It came with dua and effort. So both these two key elements are required. And inshallah, if we hold on to them, even we can achieve a nusra. Even we can be successful in our life and in the hereafter. I number 26, and those of the people of the scripture who backed them, the disbelievers, Allah brought them down from their forts and cast a, a terror into their hearts so that a group of them you killed and a group of them you made captives. So over here, what happened was that while all this commotion and fear was going on, one of the tribes of Yehud, one of the tribes of the Jews in Medina, who were actually in mutual alliance with the Muslims, they tried to attack the Muslims. They planned on um, you know, breaking the covenant that they had with the Muslims. And they resorted to breach. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed their plot and they were punished for their betrayal. I number 27, and he caused you to inherit their lands and their houses and their riches and a land which you had not trodden before. And Allah is able to do all things. So this tribe, Banu Quraytha, when they went against their covenant, they were punished. And the Muslims, they inherited their lands and their houses. So this teaches us that great difficulties actually brings great victories. So yes, Ramadan is busy. The last 10 nights are hectic, they are overwhelming, but at the end of the day, we should feel happy, we should feel content that, subhanAllah, this is the achievement that I'm aiming for. This is the success that I'm aiming for. So let us not resent the challenges, rather let us celebrate the victory, let us celebrate the success. O Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, say to your wives, if you desire the life of this world and its glitter, then come. I will make a provision for you and set you free in a handsome manner. But if you desire Allah and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the home of the hereafter, then verily Allah has prepared for the good doers amongst you an enormous reward. So we see that since the Prophet ﷺ left Mecca and migrated to Medina, life was tough because the economy of Medina was never stable. And the household of the Prophet ﷺ had to live without food and water um, for sometimes weeks and sometimes months. SubhanAllah, they were without food. The only thing they had was just water and dates that they would survive on. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights in these ayat that even though being the mother of the believers, it actually brings a lot of honor. It brings a lot of privilege to the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yet it demanded a lot of sacrifices. It demanded a lot of compromises. 
So the choice was given to them, to the wives of the Prophet wasallam, that if you want to receive the reward of the hereafter, then you will have to bear these challenges of dunya. But if you wish to collect the adornment of this dunya, of this world, then there is no compulsion on you to be part of this marriage. So a choice was given to them. However, all the wives of the Prophet وسلم, they chose hereafter over dunya. They chose akhirah over this world. And they remained with the Prophet وسلم, until um, they passed away, subhanAllah. So this decision was made by them out of free will. So this, all this um, you know, notion that some of the wives were actually forced into marrying the Prophet وسلم, like Aisha radiallahu anha, she was forced into marrying the Prophet وسلم, at a young age. This is wrong. This is incorrect 100%. Because if that was the case, now was the moment when the Prophet وسلم, himself gave this leeway to his wives that if any one of you wants to leave and go, you can go ahead, get married to anyone you want and attain the adornment of dunya. But if you want the adornment of hereafter, then you have to stay with me. And subhanAllah, all the wives of the Prophet وسلم, chose hereafter over dunya. And in this is a lesson for us too. SubhanAllah. Sometimes we are deluded with the, you know, with the beauties of, of this world, with the adornment of this world. And we're so distracted that we compromise our akhira for dunya. So we'll miss salah because of a party, because of shopping, because of a grocery. But if we truly aim for first class and hereafter, then we shouldn't compromise on our akhirah because that's not a character trait of a believer. So ayah number 30, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, all wives of the prophet, whoever of you commits an open fahsha, a great sin, the torment for her will be double. And that is ever easy for Allah. And subhanAllah, this is not, you know, this is not a statement as to say that Billah, some, some of the wives did indulge in some kind of fahsha, astaghfirullah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning that the great role that they have, subhanAllah, that actually demands great responsibility. So subhanAllah, they stayed with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they you know, took care of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They were ideal wives to him. And because of their taqwa, they will have double reward. They will have double reward. And had they messed up, they would be punished. But subhanAllah, they didn't mess up. And in them is an example for all us believing women. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and whoever of you is obedient to Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and does righteous good deeds, we shall give her her reward twice over. And we have prepared for her a noble provision. So in this family, in Ahl Bayt, in the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the daughters of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in it is an excellent example for us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the wives by saying, I number 32, O wives of the Prophet, you are not like any other woman. If you keep your duty to Allah, then do not be soft in your speech, lest he in whose heart is a disease of hypocrisy or evil desire should be moved with desire, but speak in an honorable manner. So again, in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is um, you know, highlighting to the wives that gender you know interaction between the you know uh, with the opposite gender it's not haram it is allowed it is permissible however when that interaction takes place amongst the opposite gender then how should you know how should believing women be they should speak in an honorable manner they should speak in a firm tone so as not to create any sort of ill feelings in the heart of the other person. 
And then what else Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and stay in your houses and do not display yourselves like that of the times of ignorance and perform salah and give zakah and obey Allah and his messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah wishes only to remove the evil deeds from you, O members of the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and to purify you with the thorough purification. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the believing women, the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to stay in their homes. And not to display yourselves just like the displaying in the times of ignorance. So tabaruj comes from burj. And burj literally means a tower. You know, we have heard about Burj Khalifa in Abu Dhabi, right? In Dubai. So what does Burj mean over here? It means that when you're driving, subhanAllah, into a foreign place, into a new city, what is apparent from a far distance? The downtown, right? And why is the downtown so apparent? Because of its huge, tall buildings, because of its Burj. So Tabaruj literally means when a woman dresses up in a certain manner, she puts on her makeup, she beautifies herself, she walks in a certain style in order to stand out in public. So Alhamdulillah, our hearts are clean, right? But as women, subhanAllah, it's our weakness to look beautiful. It's our weakness to stand out among others. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us in Surah Nur and in Surah Ahzab, that the inner circle where we can fulfill our wishes, where we can dress up and adorn ourselves is the inner circle of our family members, our blood relatives. And those members were highlighted to us in Surah Nur. And they will be highlighted to us in Surah Ahzab as well. However, the outer circle who are not our mahram, then we have to abide by the etiquettes and tabarruj is not permissible in the, within this outer circle. SubhanAllah, sometimes we're even, you know, covering ourselves, we're wearing hijab, we're wearing our jilbab, yet the way we interact with the opposite gender, the smiles, um, you know, the kind of talk, um, you know, the, provo the, the provocative walk, all that can create fitna. And this is something we have to refrain from. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in this ayah that homes are centers of learning. So what should we do? We should stay at home and we should you know, try our best to only go outside for a purpose, for a reason, when it's really required. And what should we busy ourselves with when we are at home? We should busy ourselves with the learning by remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by teaching our children and by raising our ummah with the guidelines of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa with the guidelines of the Quran. And of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlighting the believing woman tells us what? That it's not just the Quran that we have to you know, get ourselves acquainted with. We have to learn our academics. We should hold good degrees so that inshallah we can raise an ummah and empower our youth so that they can carry on the legacy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So inshallah, we pray and we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that we are able to um, carry out this role, the great role that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has honored us with so that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala can be placed with us. I number 34, and remember, O members of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that which is recited in your houses of the verses of Allah and Hikmah, this is verily the Quran and the Sunnah, so glorify his praises. Verily Allah is ever most courteous and well acquainted. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala tells the believing woman, the Prophet uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's wives, and again, through them, it's a command for us as well. So what should we do? That we should recite the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our houses with hikmah, with wisdom. 
So what does that mean? It means that whatever we study, whatever we learn, we put that into practice as well. That's hikmah. Why? Because in Allah kana laqifan qabira. He is very courteous. He knows the nitty gritty of our lives. He knows the inner secrets of our hearts, and he is well aware of where we are slipping, where we are messing up. So he knows our you know, he, he knows our secrets. He knows our secret posts, our tweets, whatever we're hiding, whatever we're doing on social media. He's fully aware of it. And why do you think all these commandments are given, subhanAllah, in so much detail in the Quran? Because it actually prevents us from a lot of problem, from the corruption of society that actually leads to it. So it's mentioned that subhanAllah, more than 10% of people, they say that Facebook is a source of jealousy and danger. And many times we think to ourselves, I don't do the baruj, right? I don't display myself. But many a times the pictures that we post on Facebook, they can actually incur and still feelings of jealousy in the hearts of other people, men and women. Because what generally happens, people often post glamorous, you know, romanticized pictures online, which often lead to a marital conflict amongst other couples. Because no one knows the dark side of the picture. No one knows if the couple had a fight right before they took this beautiful, fascinating picture, right? So sometimes we think this is something very naive. It's okay, what's so wrong? What's so bad about it? It's just pictures and posting. But subhanAllah, it can actually lead to a very grave danger. Re research has found that subhanAllah, 15% of married couples, they believe social media is a problem in their relationship. 16% of married couples admitted their use of Facebook has caused significant jealousy in their marriage. Why? Because if all the time women are comparing their husbands with other people's husbands, they're always comparing their marital life with other people's marital lives, then that's what they're going to be consumed with. They're not going to be able to pay attention to the ayat of Allah. Rather, they're going to stay home with kurna na, you know, fi buyuti kurna. They will stay home and just busy themselves with all this waste stage of time. 14% of married adults admitted they routinely look through their partner's social media accounts, primarily looking for evidence of infidelity, of cheating. So subhanAllah, Facebook is not really an enemy to our relationships. However, we have to be very careful. If it becomes a priority on the expense of endangering our relationships, then subhanAllah, it can incur loss for us in dunya and in akhirah. So let us be mindful, let us be careful. And that's why in this next ayah, ayah number 35, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights to us believing men and believing women. Pious men and pious women. Because together, men and women, they create a healthy society. They create a healthy structure, infrastructure. They create a healthy community. And when that happens, of course, together they can raise the pioneers of Islam. Together they can raise a generation who can carry the legacy of the Prophet So let us see, what are the character traits of these successful people? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Verily the Muslims, men and women, believers, men and women, men and women who are obedient, men and women who are truthful, men and women who are patient, men and women who are humble, men and women who give sadaqah, men and women who observe fasting, men and women who guard their chastity, and men and women who remember Allah much with their hearts and tongue. Allah has prepared for them forgiveness and a great reward. SubhanAllah. So if we actually abide by this criteria, this list 
And if we follow it, subhanAllah, in terms of bullet points, inshallah, what's the reward? Ultimate forgiveness. And subhanAllah, that is a huge reward. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is not for a believer, man or woman, when Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have decreed a matter, that they should have any option in their decision. And whoever obeys Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he has indeed strayed into a plain error. So related to this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to highlight to us a particular incident that took place in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what was it? Ayah number 37. Remember when you said to him, said to who? Zaid. On whom Allah has bestowed his grace by guiding him to Islam. And you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, too, have done a favor to him. How? By freeing him out of slavery. Keep your wife to yourself and fear Allah, but you did hide this in yourself, that which Allah will make manifest. You did fear the people, whereas Allah had a better right that you should fear him. So when Zaid had accomplished his desire from her, we gave her to you in marriage, so that in future there may be no difficulty to the believers in respect of marriage of the wives of their adopted sons, when the latter have no desire to keep them, and Allah's command must be fulfilled. So we all know that Zayd radiallahu an was married to Zainab radiallahu anha. Zainab radiallahu anha was the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and she was an Arab. Whereas Zayd radiallahu an was not even an Arab and he was a freed slave. So when they got married, there were a lot of issues of compatibility. And at that time, it was a taboo to marry the divorced wife of the adopted son. It was against their, their cultural norm. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to break this mindset. See, so he ordained this injunction upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so that he can lead the people by his own example. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Zayd radiallahu an should divorce Zainab radiallahu anha and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam should get married to her after her idda is over. And subhanAllah, when we think about it, we live in a society that stigmatizes women each time a marriage fails, right? And subhanAllah, from the story of Zayd radiallahu an and Zainab radiallahu anha, we learn that these are two best people, the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? Yet they were not able to click with each other. It was not because any one of them lacked taqwa, right? Any one of them lacked God consciousness. Rather, what was the missing element? The missing element was compatibility. So this teaches us that we should never judge a book by its cover. And why was this particular injunction given? SubhanAllah, in order to break this cultural norm that an adopted son is like a real son. Because that's not the case. That's not the case. So I number 38. There is no blame on the Prophet وسلم, in that which Allah has made legal for him. That has been the way of Allah with those who have passed away of the prophets of all. And the command of Allah is a decree which is determined. Those who convey the message of Allah fear him and fear none except Allah. And sufficient is Allah as a reckoner. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not the father of any of your men, but he is the messenger of Allah and the last of all prophets. And Allah is the ever all knower of everything. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just seals this evidence by saying that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is indeed khatam al -Nabiyyin. He is the last of prophets and there will be no prophet who will come after him. A person may say that, what about Isa alayhi salam? He's going to descend from above the heavens near the end of times. So maybe this ayah is wrong. Of course not. Absolutely not. Because 
Isa alayhi salam, when he will descend from the heavens, he will come as a follower of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He will not come as a new legislator of Islamic law. Ayah number 41, O you who believe, remember Allah with much remembrance. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu thkurullaha dhikran kathira. And that's the kind of dhikr we need to do right now during the last 10 nights so that inshallah we can seek Laylatul Qadr. And then after Ramadan ends, we still need to do what? Glorify his praises morning and afternoon. Subhanallah, even then, subhanallah, we still have to stay acquainted with Quran, with the zikr, with salah, with qiyam, because that's the motto of a believer. I number 43, he it is who sends blessings on you and his angels too ask Allah to bless you and forgive you that he may bring you out from darkness into light, into light. And he is ever most merciful to the believers. A beautiful ayah, subhanAllah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning to us the favor that he's the one who brought us out from misguidance to guidance. So if we follow his commands and abide by his book, then what's the special virtue for it? Usalli alaykum. And what does that mean? It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will shower his mercy upon us and exalt us to a high rank in a manner that the people on earth will begin to praise us. And the angels in the heavens will begin to eulogize us. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the privilege that the angels witness for us and not against us. The people witness for us and not against us. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa may witness for us and not against us. Allahumma ameen. Their greeting on the day they shall meet him will be salam, peace. And he has prepared for them a generous reward. O Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa verily we have sent you as witness and a bearer of glad tidings and a warner. And as for one who invites to Allah by his permission and as a lamp spreading light. So the Prophet ﷺ came as shahid, as a witness for us. And he came to give us glad tidings by mentioning to us about Jannah and the virtues and the merits for the followers of Islam. And he came to us as a nadir to warn us from the repercussions of sins to warn us against Jahannam. And then he came, us, came to us as Siraj al Munira, as a lamp spreading light. Because the more we learn about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the more we study his seerah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the more we will feel the nur in our life, the light and guidance in our lives, the GPS in our lives to direct us in all affairs of our life, in all facets of our life, inshallah. And announce to the believers with glad tidings that they will have from Allah a great bounty. And obey not to the disbelievers and the hypocrites and harm them not. And put your trust in Allah. Sufficient is Allah as a trustee. O you who believe, then you marry believing women and then divorce them before you have intimacy with them, nor idda have you to count in respect of them. So give them a present and set to them free in a handsome manner. Meaning, if there was marriage, but subhanAllah, there was no consummation of marriage, then there is no idda. There's no waiting period for the woman. O Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, verily we have made lawful to you your wives to whom you have paid their bridal money. And those slaves whom your right hand possess, whom Allah has given to you, and the daughters of your paternal uncles and the daughters of your paternal aunts, and the daughters of your maternal uncles and the daughters of your maternal aunts, who migrated from Mecca with you, and a believing woman, if she offers herself to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a privilege for you only, not for the rest of the believers. Meaning the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the only one who was given the permission to marry more than four. However, for the believing men, the permission is only given to marry one, two, three, or maximum four, if he is able to maintain justice between them. 
Indeed, we know what we have been joined upon them about their wives and those slaves whom their right hands possess in order that they should, there should be no difficulty on you. And Allah is ever oft forgiving and most merciful. So the marriages of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they took place again, based upon utmost wisdom. If you look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's marriage, his marriage with Khadija Radiallahu Anha, again, we see that Khadija Radiallahu Anha was 15 years older than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that marriage was not done out of lust. Then when Khadija Radiallahu Anha passed away, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was laid by the huge responsibility to take care of his kids. So again, he got married to a very old Sahabia who was Sauda radiallahu anha. And then with the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he got married to Aisha radiallahu anha with her consent, with her consent. Then he got married to widows like Umm Salama radiallahu anha. He got married to divorcees like Zainab radiallahu anha. Why? To show us that it is not a taboo to marry widows or divorcees. We should support them, not desert them. And then he got married to Jabiria radiallahu anha and Safiya radiallahu anha, who were leaders of their tribes. And due to them, subhanAllah, getting married to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa actually their entire tribe accepted Islam. Many people entered the fold of Islam. So all these marriages, they had a lot of hikmah behind them, subhanAllah. I number 51, you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, can postpone the term of whom you will of them, your wives, and you may receive whom you will. And whoever you desire of those whom you have set aside, it is no sin on you to receive her again. That is better that they may be comforted and not grieved, and may all be pleased with what you give them. Allah knows what is in your hearts and Allah is ever all knowing and all forbearing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave an option to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that if you wish, you can spend more days with one wife. Since marrying all of them was not the decision of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there was some marriages that were encouraged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this permission was given to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to stay with one wife more than the other. But SubhanAllah, because he's a leader for all of us, because he is the legacy maker for all of us, SubhanAllah, he was fair with all of them. He gave each one of his wives even turns so that none of them feels hurt. And SubhanAllah, by the way, what did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do when he would take turns to visit his wives? Did he just meet them in order to have fun? No. How do we know this? We know this from Aisha radiallahu anha when she was asked, what does the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do when he comes to visit you? She said he used to keep himself busy serving his family. And when it would be time for salah, he would get up and leave. SubhanAllah. So taking care of his family, SubhanAllah, the leader of the Ummah. He's taking care of his wife. He's taking care of the children of the household. SubhanAllah. Again, we learn from here that it's not a taboo. It's nothing of disgrace for men to help in household chores because this was the sunnah of the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam. I number 52, it is not lawful for you to marry other women after this, nor to change them for other wives, even though their beauty attracts you, except those slaves whom your right hands possess. And Allah is ever a watcher over all things. SubhanAllah. So the Prophet Sallallahu did not get married to anyone else rather than the ones who are mentioned to us in the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I number 53, O you who believe, do not enter the house of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam until permission is given to you for a meal. And then not so early as to wait for its preparation. But when you're invited, enter. And when you have taken your meal, disperse without sitting for a talk. Verily, such behavior annoys the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's shy of asking you to go, but Allah is not shy of telling you the truth. 
And when you ask his wives for anything you want, ask them from behind the screen. That is purer for your hearts and for their hearts. And it is not for you that you should annoy the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, nor that you should ever marry his wives after his death. Verily with Allah, that shall be an enormity. So just like subhanAllah in Surah Nur, we learned about some of the etiquettes of visiting someone, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us further etiquettes that when we are invited, when we visit someone, we should never overstay our welcome. We should never overstay their welcome because that is harmful for any relationship. And that is not, um, you know, that is not encouraged. So we stay for some time and subhanAllah then we leave. Whether you reveal anything or conceal it, verily Allah is ever all knower of everything. It is no sin on them. The wives of the Prophet وسلم, if they appear unveiled before their fathers or their sons or their brothers or their brother's son or the sons of their sisters or their own believing women or their female slaves, and O oh ladies, fear, keep your duty to Allah. Verily, Allah is ever all witness over everything. SubhanAllah. So again, um, some criteria is given to us, again, of the people who are ad mahram With whom, SubhanAllah, in front of whom we can dress up. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that, you know, adorning ourselves, beautifying ourselves is our weakness. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights to us that around these people, yes, we are permitted. SubhanAllah. In a ladies gathering, we are permitted. But other than that, SubhanAllah, other than this circle, there are restrictions that we have to abide by. Ayah number 56, Allah sends his salah on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and also his angels. Ask Allah to bless and forgive him. O oh, you who believe, send your salah on him, sallallahu alayhi wa and you should greet him with the Islamic way of greeting. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us over here that indeed Allah and the entire malaika make dua for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sends the peace and blessings upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So as believers, we should follow the sunnah as well. We should follow the sunnah of the angels as well. And what is it? To send durood upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned to us in one of the hadith, whoever amongst you invokes blessings upon me once, Allah records for him 10 hasanat, 10 good deeds, erases from his account 10 evil deeds and raises him 10 degrees because of it. And SubhanAllah, this is a huge amount of reward to have 10 deeds added to our account, to have 10 sins be erased from our book of deeds and to excel 10 levels higher in Jannah. SubhanAllah, that's something very, very beautiful. And we should, um, SubhanAllah, seek this honor, seek this privilege, inshallah. I number 57, verily those who annoy Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah has cursed them in this world and in the hereafter and has prepared for them a humiliating torment. And those who annoy believing men and believing women undeservedly, they bear on themselves the crime of slander and plain sin. O Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tell your wives and your daughters and the women of the believers to draw their cloaks, to draw their wheels over their bodies. That will be better that they should be known so as they are not to be annoyed. And Allah is ever oft forgiving and most merciful. So in this ayah who are addressed, the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the daughters of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then the believing woman. So this command goes out to us as well. That Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is commanding us that all of us need to put on an extra layer of clothing over whatever we are wearing. So just like we mentioned before, there is undergarments that we wear, nobody sees that. 
There is inner garments. Those are the clothes that we regularly wear in home. And then there is an outer layer of clothing which we have to wear when we go outside. And this can be a jilbab. This can be a long shawl or a loose cardigan so that it doesn't reveal the shape of our body. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the wisdom behind it so that the believing woman can be known. Hmm, known for what? Known to be chaste so that nobody can harass them. Nobody can harm them. SubhanAllah. So there's a great wisdom behind it. If the hypocrites and those in whose hearts is a disease and those who spread false news amongst the people in Medina do not stop, we shall certainly let you overpower them. Then they will not be able to stay in it as your neighbors, but a little while. Accursed, they shall be seized wherever found and killed with a terrible slaughter. That was the way of Allah, sunnah Allah, in the case of those who passed away of old. And you will not find any change in the way of Allah. People ask you concerning the hour. Say the knowledge of it is with Allah only. What will make you know? It may be that the hour is near. Verily, Allah has cursed the disbelievers and has prepared for them a flaming fire. Wherein they will abide forever and they will find neither a protector nor a helper. On the day when their faces will be turned over in the fire, they will say, ah, oh, I wish. With that, we had obeyed Allah and obeyed the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they will be in the midst of deep regrets, hasra, remorse. And they will say, our Lord, verily, we obeyed our chiefs and our great ones. And they misled us from the right path. Our Lord, give them double torment and curse them with a mighty curse. SubhanAllah, they're going to make dua that the curse of Allah may reach their leaders whom they followed. But SubhanAllah, even if that happens, it cannot grant them a security against their own punishment. So definitely it's going to be painful. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to be good leaders, to be good trendsetters. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us that we follow the right leaders. Allahumma amin. O you who believe, be not like those who annoyed Musa alayhi salam, but Allah cleared him of that which they alleged, and he was honorable before Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning to us, do not be like how the Bani Israel would annoy Prophet Musa alayhi salam by asking too many questions. Rather be like the believing men and women. Who do what? I number 70, or you who believe, keep your duty to Allah and fear him and speak the truth. So subhanAllah, we ask questions not out of curiosity, but to implement, to clarify our confusion. And when that confusion is clarified, what do we do? We keep our duty to Allah and we fear him. And we speak the truth by enacting on the knowledge that we have learned. And when we do that, what will happen? I number 71, he will direct you to do righteous good deeds and will forgive you your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he has indeed achieved a great achievement. Truly, we did offer al-amana, responsibility to the heavens and the earth and the mountains, but they declined to bear it and were afraid of it. But man, Al-Insan, he bore it. Verily, he was unjust to himself and he was ignorant of its results. So what is this amana that is mentioned in this ayah? What is this trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning? This was a trust offered to the different creatures in dunya, but they all refused. And the human being accepted. And this amana, this trust, was actually the burden of responsibility. Responsibility to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should remember that this freedom that we have in this life, what is it? It is actually a trust. It is actually a responsibility. 
are we obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not? So in these ayat of Surah Ahzab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights to us three types of people with respect to this amana, with respect to this trust. Number one, those who fulfill it, meaning those who uphold it externally and internally, and they are believers. For them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will erase their sins, will forgive them for their shortcomings and accept their repentance because they're sincere. Number two, there's another group of people who neither uphold it externally nor internally. So they are mushrikeen. They are totally rejecting this amara. So they are mushrikeen. And then third, those people who are only upholding this amana externally on the outward. So they say, yeah, we believe, we follow the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but internally their hearts are empty. They do not have iman. And these are the hypocrites. These are the munafiqi. So we need to see which category I wish to belong. And then, inshallah, we all aim to be in the first category. So that, inshallah, we're able to seek the pleasure of Allah. I number 73, so that Allah will punish the hypocrites, men and women, and the men and women who are mushrikeen. And Allah will pardon the true believers, men and women. And Allah is ever oft forgiving and most merciful. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the privilege to be under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, under the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of Qiyamah. Ameen ya rabbal alameen. So now uh, we have Surah Saba and subhanallah, uh, Surah Saba is a Makki Surah again. So the theme of uh, Makki Surah is going to be very much similar to the other Makki Surahs that we just did. SubhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give us different stories of the prophets and, um, you know, different highlights are going to be presented to us about Jannah and Nar. So let us see, SubhanAllah, what beautiful gems this surah has to offer. So I number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alhamdulillahi alladhi lahu ma fil samawati wa ma fil ard. All praise and thanks to Allah, to whom belongs all that is in the heavens and all that is in the earth. His is all praise and thanks in the hereafter, and he is all vice, the well acquainted with all things. He knows that which goes into the earth and that which comes forth from it and that which descends from the heaven, and that which ascends to it. And he is the most merciful and oft forgiving. Those who disbelieve, they say, the hour will not come to us. Say, yes, by my Lord, the all-knower of the unseen, it will come to you, not even the weight of an atom, or less than that, or greater, escapes his knowledge in the heavens or in the earth. But it is in a clear book that he may recompense those who believe and they do righteous deeds. Those, theirs is forgiveness and risk kareem. But those who strive against our ayah to frustrate them, those for them will be a severe painful torment. And those who have been given knowledge to see that what is revealed to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from your Lord is the truth, and that it guides to the path of the exalted in might, the, no, the owner of all praise. Those who disbelieve say, shall we direct you to a man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who will tell you when you have become fully disintegrated into dust with a full dispersion, that you will be created again in a new form? Has he, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, invented a lie against Allah or is there madness in him? No, but those who disbelieve in the hereafter are themselves in a torment and in far error. Do they not see what is before them and what is behind them of the heaven and the earth? If we will, we shall sink the earth with them or cause a piece of the heaven to fall upon them. Verily, in this is a sign for every slave who turns to Allah in the repentance. 
And indeed, we bestow the grace on Da'ud from us, saying, O oh, you mountains, glorify Allah with him, and you birds also. And we made the iron soft for him. So one of the miracles that was given to Dawood was that each time he would recite the Zabur, the mountains and the birds would echo the recitation for him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions another miracle that was given to him was that the iron was made soft for him. And subhanAllah, that was one of the reasons Bani Israel actually won over Goliath and they were successful. Because through this iron, subhanAllah, Dawood was able to um, you know, mold the iron into different forms and create armors for them, create uh, you know, plated nails for them in order to protect them in battle. And subhanAllah, this was a source for victory for Bani Israel. So I number 11 saying, make perfect coats of mail and balance perfectly the rings of chain armor and work with the men in righteousness. Truly, I am all need, uh, all nor. Uh, truly, I am all seer of what you do. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us the example of his son, the son of Dawood alayhi salam, who is he, Sulaiman alayhi salam. And to Suleiman, the wind, its morning stride from sunrise till mid-noon was a month's journey. And its afternoon was a month's journey. And we caused a fount of molten brass to flow for him. And there were jinn that worked in front of him by the permission of his Lord. And whosoever of them turned aside from our command, we shall cause him to taste of the torment of the blazing fire. So Sulaiman salam, he was given another miracle, which was different to that which was given to his father. What was that miracle? Sulaiman salam, was given control over the wind. So he could fly, he could travel. And it's mentioned that he had a flying carpet, which was able to cover one month's journey, subhanAllah, very swiftly within a short span of time. What else was he given? He was given control over the jinn and animals. So subhanAllah, he was given a very mighty kingdom that was not given to any other prophet. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights to us that how the jinns would work for Sulaiman alayhi salam under his throne, under his authority. I number 13, Surah Saba, they worked for him as he desired, making high rooms, images, basins as large as reservoirs, and cooking cauldrons fixed in their places. Work you, O family of Dawood, with shukr, with thanks, but few of my slaves are grateful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights to us that the family of Dawood alayhi salam was a family of shukr, was a family of gratitude. So let us see subhanAllah together, how is our family? What is the state of our family? Are we a family of shukr? Can we say that our children are full of gratitude? Our husband, our parents, us, most importantly, are we women of gratitude? Or do we complain 24 seven? Oh, I don't have this. I need to buy this. Oh, this is something which is missing. Oh, that's something which is so amazing about this girl's um, house, this girl's um, you know, clothes, wardrobe. She has so much, she's better than me, how come? So again, assessing ourselves that how much gratitude do we have? And together as a family, what kind of unity and teamwork we have in terms of being grateful slaves? Are we Aibadi Ashakur or not? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to be people of gratitude. Amen. I number 14, then when we decreed death for him for Suleiman. Nothing informed them of his death except a little worm of the earth, which kept gnawing away his stick. 
So when he fell down, the jinn saw clearly that if they had known of the unseen, they would not have stayed in the humiliating torment. So subhanAllah, what happened was that um, Sulaiman alayhi salam, he was monitoring the jinns doing work for him. And during that process, during that time frame, the Malik al came and took his soul. So he passed away. But subhanAllah, one of the miracles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was that he was leaning on his stick. And subhanAllah, nobody came to know that Sulaiman alayhi salam has passed away. He has died. Until a small bug kept gnawing on the stick. It started eating the stick. And then when the stick collapsed, the jinns came to know that subhanAllah, Sulaiman alayhi salam died long ago. And what is the wisdom behind mentioning this in the Quran? That jinns do not know al ghaib They do not know the unseen. Because many people who indulge in sorcery, they actually interact with jinn thinking that they know the unseen. But if we believe that this is kufr, because nobody knows al ghaib other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is Ali Mulay. He is the knower of unseen. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us two examples of grateful people who are they, Sulaiman alayhi salam and his father Dawood alayhi salam. Both of them were people of gratitude, family of shukr. And now an opposite example is going to be given to us. An example of ungrateful people. Who are they? Indeed, there was for Saba a sign in their dwelling place, two gardens on the right hand and on the left. It was said to them, eat of the provision of your Lord and be grateful to him. A fair land and oft forgiving Lord. But they turned away from the obedience to Allah. So we sent against them flood released from the dam and we converted their two gardens into gardens producing bitter bad fruit and turmeric and some few lot trees so subhanallah all their um you know all their fruits and their harvests just turned transformed into bitter fruits thorny shrubs and subhanallah few lot trees so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us the repercussion of ingratitude the consequence of ingratitude Ingratitude leads towards loss, whereas gratitude leads towards success. Because what did we learn in Surah Ibrahim? If you are grateful, indeed, I will give you more. So inshallah, we need to choose the better example. And who is it? Prophet Dawood alayhi salam, Prophet Sulaiman alayhi salam. And we have to be grateful. Like this, we requited them because they were ungrateful disbelievers. And never do we requit in such a way except those who are ungrateful. And we placed between them blessed towns easy to be seen. And we made the stages of journey between them easy, saying, travel in them safely, both by night and day. Subhanallah. So these people, it's actually referring to a place which was known by Saba. The surah is named after it, after this, uh, you know, these people. And it's referring to the kings and people of Yemen in particular. Because this was a place, these were a nation, these were people who were given a huge dam. And a lot of provisions actually centered, revolved around that dam because of that immense water supply. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said there was peace, there was security, people were able to travel freely, people were able to benefit from the water and the fruits. But what happened? I number 19, they said, our Lord, make the stages between our journey longer. And they wronged themselves, so we made them as tails in the land, and we dispersed them all totally, verily, and this are indeed signs for every steadfast, grateful person. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted them ease, but they prayed for challenges. They prayed for a difficulty. They prayed for affliction and calamity. So their dua was heard. And then what else did they do when they were at times of ease? Instead of thanking Allah and being grateful people, they started worshiping the sun. And they committed kufr, kufr against Allah. So they were punished. So whose legacy did they follow? They followed the legacy of Iblis because Iblis portrayed ingratitude. So in the very next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will mention to us Iblis. And indeed Iblis, Shaitan, had proven true his thought about them. And they followed him all except a group of true believers. So all of them, they were given loss. They were punished except for a few believers. And he, Iblis, had no authority over them except that we might test them. We might test him who believes in the hereafter from him who is in doubt about it. And your Lord is watchful over everything. Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, two polytheists call upon those whom you assert to be associate gods besides Allah. They possess not even an atoms or a small atoms weight either in the heavens or in the earth nor have they any share in either, nor there is for him any supporter from among them. Intercession with him profits not, except for him whom he permits, so much so that when fear is banished from their hearts, they, the angels, say, what is it that your Lord has said? They say the truth, and he is the most high, and he is the most great. Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who gives you provision from the heavens and the earth? Say, Allah, and verily either we or you are rightly guided or in plain error. Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you will not be asked about our sins, nor shall we be asked of what you do. Say, our Lord will assemble us all together on the day of resurrection, then he will judge between us with truth. And he is the just judge, the all-knower of the true state of affairs. So these ayat are given in the Quran because the people of Makkah were actually following the same legacy. They were being ungrateful people. The Prophet ﷺ was sent to them for their guidance, but they rejected him. The Quran was sent to them for their hidayah, but they denied it. They rejected it. They declined to accept it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to say that none of us will be asked about each other. We're only accountable for our own deeds, for our own sins. So let us prepare appropriately because we have to face a day when we all shall be resurrected. Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, show me those whom you have joined with him as partners. No, there are not at all any partners with him, but he is Allah alone, who is the almighty and all wise. And we have not sent you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, except as a giver of glad tidings and a warner to all mankind, but most of men, they do not know. And they say, when is this promise, the day of resurrection, going to come if you are truthful? Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the appointment to you is for a day, which you cannot put back for an hour or a moment, nor put forward. Meaning, if we're so excited about the day of judgment, when is it, when is it? That knowledge is not going to benefit us in the least. What is going to benefit us is the preparation for the day of judgment. And those who believe, they say, we believe not in this Quran, nor in that which was before it. But if you could see when the wrongdoers will be made to stand before their Lord, how they will cast the blaming word one to another. Those who were deemed weak will say to those who were arrogant, had it not been for you, we should certainly have been believers. 
And those who are arrogant will say to those who are deemed weak, did we keep you back from guidance after it had come to you? No, but you were criminals. SubhanAllah, imagine two friends and both of them are indulging in crime and they're both thrown into prison. No matter how much they blame each other, no matter how much they, they physically abuse each other, no one is going to be brought out of that prison because both of them committed injustice against themselves. In dunya, subhanAllah, if a person ends up in prison like that, there is still hope that maybe he or she will come out. Maybe he will have a lighter sentence. But in akhirah, there is no second chance. There is no hope. So let us make dua. Let us prepare for our akhirah before it's too late. Ayah number 33, those who are deemed weak will say to those who are arrogant, no, but it was your plotting by the night and day when you ordered us to disbelieve in Allah and set up rivals to him and each of them parties will conceal their own regrets when they behold their torment and we shall put iron collars and we shall put iron collars round the necks of those who disbelieved are they requited aught except what they used to do and we did not send a warner to a township but those who were given the worldly wealth and luxuries among them said we believe not in the message with which you have been sent and they say we are more in wealth than children and we're not going to be punished so, so again subhanallah this this analogy is actually critiqued over here that we should never assume that subhanallah because we're wealthy because we're successful in dunya that's how we're going to be in akhirah subhanallah our destiny in akhirah our rank and position in akhirah is not going to be determined on the worldly possessions that we own rather it will be determined based upon the righteous deeds that we perform See, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, verily my Lord enlarges the provision to whom he wills and restricts, but most men do not know. And it is not your wealth, nor your children that bring you nearer to us, but only he who believes and does righteous deeds will please us. As for such, there will be twofold reward for what they did, and they will reside in the high dwellings Jannah in peace and security. And those who strive against our ayat to frustrate them, they will be brought to the torment. Say truly, my Lord enlarges the provision for whom he wills of his slaves and also restricts it for him. And whatsoever you spend of anything in the cause of Allah, he will replace it. Can he is the best of providers. So whatever we spend, anything, whether we give money, whether we give smile to others, whether we help, whether we're charitable, whether we sacrifice, anything that we do, in the path of Allah, to please Allah, it will be replaced with a reward in the hereafter. And that's something that we all require. And remember the day when he will gather them all together, then he will say to the angels, was it you that these people used to worship? Then the angels will say, Subhanak, glorified are you. You are our Lord instead of them. No, but they used to worship the jinn. Most of them were believers in them. So today, none of you can profit or harm one another. And we shall say to those who did wrong, taste the torment of the fire, which you used to deny. And when our clear ayat are recited to them, they say, this Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not but a man who wishes to hinder you from that which your fathers used to worship. 
And they say, this Quran is nothing but an invented lie. And those who disbelieve say of the truth, when it has come to them, this is nothing but evident magic. And we had not given them scriptures which they could study, nor sent to them before you any warner. And those before them denied, these have not received even a tenth of what we had granted to those of old, yet they denied my messengers. Then how terrible was my denial. So these people, the people of Mecca, subhanAllah, just prior to prophethood, they exalted the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa so much that they would call him as a sadiq al amin they would refer him as the most trustworthy and the most truthful. And subhanAllah, what scheme of shaitan that as soon as Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam invited them to Islam, they just flip on their words. And the very same title of being truthful, they replaced it with a liar. By claiming that this Quran is actually nothing but forgery, nothing but a, a production of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a documentation by him. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, say to them, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I exhort you to one thing only, that you stand up for the sake of Allah in pairs and single and reflect, there is no madness in your companion, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's only a warner to you in face of this severe torment. Say, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whatever wage I might have asked of you is yours. My wage is from Allah only, and He is the witness over all things. Say, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, my Lord sends down revelation and makes apparent to the truth, and he is the all-knower of the unseen. Surah Saba, ayah number 49, say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa the truth has come, and falsehood has perished. It can neither create anything nor resurrect. Say, if even I go astray, I shall stray only to my own loss. But if I remain guided, it is because of the revelation of my Lord to me. Truly, he is all hearer, ever near to all things. And if you could but see when they will be terrified with no escape for them, and they will be seized from a near place, and they will say in the hereafter, we do believe now. But how could they receive faith and acceptance of their repentance from a place so far off? So they will wish to be returned to the worldly life, but their wish is not going to be given. It's not going to be granted. Indeed, they did disbelieve before in this world, and they used to conjecture about the unseen. In the hereafter, Jahannam, resurrection, the promise of Allah, they claim that all that is untrue. So they are going to be from a far place. They're not going to be helped. And a barrier will be set between them and that which they desire. Turning to Allah in repentance and accepting of faith, as was done in the past with the people of their kind, verily they have been in grave doubt. So what is this barrier? The barrier on the day of judgment is going to be between them and Hidayah, between them and repentance. Because on the Day of Judgment, there are no second chances. May Allah forgive us for our shortcomings and may Allah guide us. So that's the conclusion of Surah Saba. And now we have Surah Fatir, again, a beautiful Makki Surah. Surah Fatir, or it's also known as Surah Malaika. Fatir means the originator of creation. And that's one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's also known as Surah Malaika. And Malaika means angels because in this uh, surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to mention to us the creation of angels. How he has created them in different terms, in different ways. So let us begin. Ayah number one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off the surah by saying, Alhamdulillahi faqir as-samawati wal-ard. Ja'ilil malaika. 
All praise and thanks are to Allah, who is the originator of the heavens and the earth, who made the angels as messengers with wings two, three, or four. He increases in creation what he wills. Verily, Allah is able to do all things. So just like we mentioned before that subhanAllah, there is a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who are around us and they are angels. So there are different types of angels and they have different physical attributes. So some angels, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes over here, they have, you know, they have wings. Some have two wings, some have three wings, some have four wings. And we know from the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Jibreel salam, he has 600 wings. SubhanAllah. So these angels, they have different physical attributes. But what's the one common thing about them? They remember Allah. And they never get exhausted remembering Allah. They have no need for eating or drinking. They follow the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is assigned to them. And their number is infinity. We have no clue as to how many malaika there are. So subhanAllah, two are just there with us, with each one of us who are recording our deeds. Then there are malaika out there who actually search and look for the gatherings of ilm where people are remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they pray for that gathering that Allah should forgive them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable our gathering to be one of those. And then there are so many other malaika which are given different tasks. Like Mikail alayhi salam is in charge of rain. Malikul Maud is in charge of taking the soul, the ruh from a person to give him death. And some malaika, like Jibreel alayhi salam especially, had the task of bringing the wahi to the prophets. SubhanAllah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us, whatever of mercy Allah may grant to mankind, none can withhold it. And whatever he may withhold, none can grant it thereafter. And he is the almighty and all wise. O mankind, remember the grace of Allah upon you. Is there any creator other than Allah who provides for you from the sky, rain, and the earth? None has the right to be worshipped but he. How then are you turning away from him? So subhanAllah, just like the malaika, they have different physical attributes, but their mission is one, to remember Allah. Just like that, all of us, even though we have different physical attributes, we belong to different social status. We belong to different ethnicities, yet our mission is one. It is to worship Allah alone without any partners, to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and follow the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So item number four, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and if they deny you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so were the messengers denied before you. And to Allah return all matters for decision. O mankind, verily the promise of Allah is true. So let not this present life deceive you. And let not the chief deceiver, shaitan, deceive you about Allah. Surely, shaitan is an enemy to you. So take threat. So, take, uh, so treat him as an enemy. He only invites his followers that they may become the dwellers of the blazing fire. Those who disbelieve. Theirs will be a severe torment. And those who believe and do righteous deeds, theirs will be forgiveness and a great reward. Is he then to whom the evil of his deeds is made fairer seeming, so that he considers it as good, equal to one who is rightly guided? Verily, Allah sends astray whom he wills and guides whom he wills. So do not destroy yourself, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in sorrow for them. Truly, Allah is all knower of what they do. And it is Allah who sends the winds so that they raise up the clouds and we drive them to a dead land and revive therewith the earth after its death. As such will be resurrection. So again, the analogy of this world is given, um, subhanAllah, so that we can think about the day of resurrection. Just like how a dead land is revived through rain, 
just like that, we are going to be resurrected on the day of resurrection. Whosoever desires honor, glory, power, then to Allah belong all honor, power, and glory. To him ascend all the goodly words and the righteous deeds exalted. But those who plot evil, theirs will be a severe torment, and the plotting of such will perish. So our deeds, they ascend to Allah. And through it, we are exalted. We are honored and we're mentioned. That's why, what should we do? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fadhkuruni adhkurkum. You remember me and I will remember you. And Allah did create you, Adam, from dust, then from nutfa, mixed drops of discharge. Then he made you pairs, male and female. And no female conceives or gives birth, but with his knowledge. And no aged man is granted length of life, nor is a part cut off from his life but it is recorded in a book, Allah Mafuz. Surely that is easy for Allah. And the two seas are not alike. This is palatable, sweet and pleasant to drink. And the other one is saltish and bitter. And from them, both of you, you eat fresh tender meat, fish, and you derive the ornaments that you wear. And you see the ships cleaving the sea water that you may seek of his bounty and that you may give shukr, subhanAllah. So there's so many different benefits that we derive from sea, from sea life, subhanAllah, so that we can travel, so that we can eat from it. And subhanAllah, we can enjoy the marine life by looking at it. And so that we can beautify and adorn its, uh, ourselves through the pearls, through the jewels that are hidden in the depths of the sea. He merges the night into the day, and he merges the day into the night. And he has subjected the sun and the moon. Each runs on its course for a term appointed. Such is Allah, your Lord. His is the kingdom. And those whom you invoke or call upon instead of him, they do not even own a qitmir, a thin membrane over the date stone. If you call upon them, they do not hear your call. And if in case they were to hear, they could not grant your request to you. And on the day of resurrection, they will disown your worshiping them. And none can inform you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa like him who is well acquainted. O mankind, it is you who stand in need of Allah. But Allah is rich. He's free of all needs, the worthy of all praise. So many a times when we pray salah, we feel that we have done some kind of ihsan to Allah, right? Okay, fine, I'm done with salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that when we pray, when we remember Allah, when we do tasbih, whether it's on Laylatul Qadr, whether it's after Ramadan, we're not doing any ihsan for Allah. SubhanAllah, Allah, He is lenny, He's free of all needs. He doesn't need our deficient, weak prayers. We're doing it for our own self. We're doing it for our own God consciousness. We're doing it for our akhirah in order to seek the pleasure of Allah. So the more we beautify our prayers, the more we adorn it, the more it is better for our own selves. If he willed, he could destroy you and bring about a new creation. And that is not hard for Allah. So if Allah wills, he can bring someone else in our replacement who can pray better, who can recite the Quran better, who can be more helpful towards humanity and people. He can very well do that. But Ya Rab, we do not want to be replaced. We ask your forgiveness and we want to reform ourselves. So Allah says, and no bearer of burdens shall bear another's burden. And if one heavily laden calls another to bear his load, nothing of it will be lifted, even though he be near of kin. You, O Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, can warn only those who fear their Lord in the unseen and perform salah. And he who purifies himself from all kinds of sins, then he purifies only for the benefit of his own self. And to Allah is the final return. Not alike are the blind and the seeing. Not alike is the darkness and the light. 
Not alike is the shade and the sun's heat. Not alike are the living and the dead. Verily, Allah makes whom he wills to hear, but you cannot make hear those who are in the graves. So just like these things are not alike, just like that, a believer and non-believer is not alike. You, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are only, or only a warner. Your duty is to convey, but the guidance is from Allah. Verily, we have sent you with the truth, a bearer of glad tidings and a warner, and there never was a nation, but a warner had passed among them. And if they deny you, those before them were also denied. Their messengers came to them with the clear signs and with the scriptures and the book giving light. Then I took hold of those who disbelieved and how terrible was my punishment. Do you not see that Allah sends down water from the sky and we produce there with fruits of various colors and among the mountains there are streaks white and red of varying colors and others very black? And likewise, men and moving living creatures, beasts and cattle of various colors. It is only those who have knowledge amongst the slaves that fear Allah. Verily, Allah is almighty and oft forgiving. So we should remember, <inaudible> If we truly want to attain the hashia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we should learn more about him. We should acknowledge ourselves more with the speech of Allah, with the Quran. We should learn about the person who taught us the Quran by reading the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. And the more we acquaint ourselves with it, the more we submerge ourselves with it, the more, inshallah, we can attain the khashi of Allah, the fear of Allah. Verily, those who recite the book of Allah and perform salah and spend in charity all the what we have provided for them secretly and openly, they are the ones who hope for a sure trade gain that will never perish, that he may pay them their wages in full and give them even more out of his grace. Verily, he is oft forgiving, most ready to appreciate. And what we have revealed to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, of the book, it is the very truth. And your followers must act on its instruction, confirming that which was revealed before it. Verily, Allah, he is indeed well acquainted and all seer of his slaves. Then we gave the book as inheritance to such of our slaves whom we chose, subhanAllah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose us to be the followers of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to be the inheritor of this knowledge, to be the reciters of this Quran. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, then of them are some who wrong themselves, and of them are some who follow a middle course, and of them are some who are by the permission of Allah, the foremost in deeds, sabiqun bil khayrat. That indeed is the great grace. Again, we have to see which class of Jannah I want to be in. Do I want to be in the first class? Then I have to be among sabiqun bil khayrat. Do I want to be in business class? Then of course I will do something and then I will slack off. I will remember Allah sometimes and then I will forget. Or do I want to be in the economy class who keep on wronging themselves? So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Ya Rabb, make us like the companions who were sabiqun bil khayrat, who were the foremost in good deeds and forgive our shortcomings. Grant us hidayah. At the Jannah, paradise, Will they enter? Therein they will be adorned with the bracelets of gold and pearls, and their garments will be of silk. And they will say, All praise and thanks are to Allah, who has removed from us all chism, all grief. 
Verily, our Lord is indeed oft forgiving, most ready to appreciate. The name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Shakur is so beautiful because many a times in dunya, when we do something good for someone, sometimes people acknowledge it and sometimes they totally ignore it. They pretend as if, ah, I just deserve it. So what's so great if you help me? But in the case of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter whatever we do, even if we put in an atom's weight of effort, to please Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is shakur. He appreciates it. He acknowledges it. And he rewards us for it. Subhanallah. Who out of his grace has lodged us in a home that will last forever, where toil will touch us not, nor weariness will touch us. But those who disbelieve for them will be the fire of Jahannam. Neither will it have the com complete killing effect on them so that they die, nor shall its torment be lightened for them. Thus do we requit every disbeliever. Therein they will cry, our Lord, bring us out. We shall do righteous good deeds that we used to do. Allah will reply, did we not give you lives long enough so that whatsoever would receive, so that whosoever receives admonition could receive it? And the warner came to you. So taste the punishment of your evil deeds. For the wrongdoers, there is no helper. Verily, Allah is all-knower of the unseen of the heavens and the earth. Verily, he is the all-knower of what is in the chests. He it is who has made you successors generations after generations in the earth. So whosoever disbelieves, on him will be his disbelief. And the disbelief of the disbelievers adds nothing but hatred of their Lord. And the disbelief of the disbeliever adds nothing but loss. Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa tell me, what do you think about your so-called partner gods to whom you call upon besides Allah? Show me what they have created of the earth or have they any share in the heavens? Or have they, or have we given them a book so that they act on clear proof therefrom? No, the wrongdoers promise one another nothing but delusions. Verily, Allah grasps the heavens and the earth, lest they should move away from their places. And if they were to move away from their places, there is a not one that could grasp them after him. Truly, he is an ever most forbearing, oft forgiving. And they swear by Allah, their most binding oaths, that if a warner came to them, they would be more guided than any of the nations before them. Yet when a warner came to them, it increased in them nothing but flight from the truth. They took to flight because of their arrogance in the land and their plotting of evil. But the evil plot encomp encompasses only him who makes it. Then can they expect anything else but the sunnah way of dealing of the people of old? So no change will you find in the sunnah of Allah and no turning off will you find in the way of dealing. Have they not traveled in the land unseen? What was the end of those before them? Though they were superior to them in power, Allah is not such that anything in the heavens or in the earth escapes him. Verily, he is all-knowing and all-omnipotent. Ayah number 45, Surat Fatir. And if Allah were to punish men for that which they earned, he would not leave a moving living creature on the surface of the earth but he gives them respite to an appointed term. And when their term comes, then verily Allah is ever all seer of his slaves. So that's the conclusion of Surah Fatir. Each one of us, we have been given ajal in musamma. We have been given an appointed term. So we need to see how well we are performing in this journey of life because we never know very soon will be our departure time will be our departure time to Barzakh and then to hereafter. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to live by taqwa. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa so that on that day, Allah 
He is kana bi ibadihi basira. He is a well seer of all our deeds so that he is able to grant us success and grant us rewards on the day of judgment through Jannah, through his pleasure. Insha'Allah. Allahumma ameen. So with that said, insha'Allah, we're going to conclude our session for today. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka, nastaghfiruka, nastaghfiruka. Bima natubu ilayk. Rabbana atkina fi dunya hasana. Wa fil akhirati hasana. Waqina adab al-nar. Allahumma anis wahshati fi qabri. Allahumma arhamni bil Qur'an al-azim. Waj'alhu li imama wa nuram wa hudam wa rahma. اللهم ذكرني منهما نسيت وعلمني منهما جهلت وارزقني تلاوته آناء الليل وآناء النهار وجعله لي حجة يا رب العالمين يا الله um, grant us um, the opportunity to avail this Quran and to be guided this through this Quran يا الله enable us to make this Quran be a source of light for us. Ya Allah, enable us to be guidance and grace for us in our grave. Revive our memory of whatever we were made to be forget. We were made to forget from this noble Quran. Grant us understanding of whatever part we do not know. Enable us to recite it during the hours of the day and night and make it a main argumentative support for all of us in all matters, O nourisher of the worlds. Ya Allah, grant shifa to all the people who are sick. Adhib al-ba'sa rabba nasi wa shfi anta shafi. La shifa'a illa shifa'uka shifa'a la yulghadiru saqama. Ya Allah, so many people have passed away. Two of my relatives just recently passed away yesterday, last night. Ya Allah, have mercy on them. Forgive them. Honor them. Exalt them. And choose them amongst your pious ones. اللهم اغفر له وارحمه وعافه واعف عنه واكرم نزله ووسع مدخله واغسله بالماء والثلج والبرد ونقه من الخطايا كما نقيت الثوب الابيض من الدنس وابدله دارا خيرا من داره واهلا خيرا من اهله وزوجا خيرا من زوجه وادخله الجنه واعذه من عذاب القبر ومن عذاب النار Ya Allah, forgive all our deceased. Have mercy on all of them. Grant them peace and pardon all of them. Receive them with honor and make their place of entry in grave spacious. Wash them with water, snow, ice, and cleanse them of their faults like a white garment is cleansed of stains. Ya Allah, substitute for them an abode better than this abode, a family better than this family, and a spouse better than this spouse. Ya Allah, admit them into Jannah and protect them from the torment of the grave and the torment of the fire. Allahumma ameen. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala nabiyyana Muhammad. Jazakumullahu al-khayran kathira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.